Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. I think it's just after three uh, and we'll begin. Uh, thank you very much for joining us in our second seminar, uh, looking at 10 years of the Equality Act, uh, particularly with reference to housing law issues and trying to see where we go to next. I think historically, uh, the housing lawyers have not been perhaps at the head of the queue when it comes to Equality Act issues. I think the employment lawyers have uh, been dealing with discrimination issues for, for a very long time. But there has been a flurry of uh, case law and activity uh, since the Equality Act came into uh, being. And I'm particularly uh, pleased to be able to welcome uh, Sarah Steinhardt and Ben Chataway, who are the speakers today, who are both very experienced uh, housing lawyers, but with a very significant expertise in equality law issues. Uh, Sarah will be speaking to us about positive action in housing, what that means, and in particular with reference to advancement of equality. And we'll be looking at whether when there is a duty to take positive action to try to uh, counterbalance the effect of a protected characteristic in a, in a positive way. And then Ben is going to be focusing on discrimination issues in homelessness cases and looking at what the correct forum is to raise them, uh, particularly as those of you who will use the Equality Act frequently know that in an Equality Act case, the county court has the same powers uh, uh, possibly as the powers of a high court judge in a judicial review. So I look forward to that. So without further ado then, Sarah, I'll pass on to you. Thank you, Zia. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk about positive action, um, trying to think about how that can be used in housing and what it means. Um, the starting point really is that uh, pos is that positive action is not the same as positive discrimination. Uh, so positive discrimination would mean treating people with certain protected characteristics more favourably than other people. And that is unlawful under the Equality Act because, of course, it necessarily means that if one group of people is being treated more favourably, then another group of people are being treated uh, less favourably. But there are three different uh, provisions or three different ways in which positive action uh, might be uh, lawful under the Equality Act. And, and that's what we call uh, positive action. So if I can turn to the uh, first slide, please, Ben. Thank you. Um, so the first way in which uh, positive action uh, is lawful is in relation to disability. So the reason why positive discrimination, as it is, is sometimes called, is uh, the reason why it is not lawful is because it would amount to direct discrimination under Section 13. So less favourable treatment because of a person's uh, protected characteristic. But you can see that Section 13.3 expressly excludes the situation uh, for uh, disabled people. So if the protected characteristic is disability and B is not a disabled person, A does not discriminate against B only because A treats or would treat disabled persons more favourably than A treats B. And it's because of this that it is lawful to um, make, to take steps uh, pursuant to the duty to make reasonable adjustments that might involve treating a disabled person more favourably than a person not having that disability. If I can have the next slide. So the, um, the main uh, provision that I'm going to be talking about is uh, section 158. So this is the power to take positive action. Uh, and this applies where a person, uh, P, reasonably thinks that A, persons who share a protected characteristic suffer a disadvantage connected to the characteristic, and we're, we're going to come back to these bits that are, in, that are highlighted in red. B, persons who protect, share a protected characteristic have needs that are different from the needs of persons who do not share it. Or C, participation in an activity by persons who share a pr protected characteristic is disproportionately low. Um, so this, uh, this uh, means that positive action 
um, under section 158, which would otherwise be unlawful, becomes lawful pursuant to section 158. Can we have the next slide, please? So those are the circumstances in which uh, action, positive action can be taken. And then uh, at section 1582, we have the powers to take that positive action. So uh, in the circumstances at, at subsection one, uh, the act does not prohibit P from taking any action, which is a proportionate means of achieving uh, the aim of, and we'll come back to this proportionality, enabling or encouraging persons who share the protected characteristic to overcome or minimize that disadvantage, meeting those needs or enabling or encouraging persons who share a protected characteristic to participate in that activity. So you can see that the powers under section 1582 mirror and reflect the circumstances that we saw at section 1581. We're, we're gonna come back to this. Um, at section uh, 1586, uh, we can see that this section does not enable P to do anything that is prohibited by or unlawful under any enactment other than this act. So again, what this does is it makes lawful what would otherwise be unlawful discrimination under section 13, but it doesn't enable uh, a person to take any step which is lawful, which it would be unlawful for any other reason. Um, can we have the next slide, please? Uh, so you will see that um, section 158 appears in the same part of the Equality Act, uh, part 11, as the public sector equality duty. Uh, and it's headed the advancement of equality. And for that reason, section 158 should be read in conjunction with section 149. Uh, and we, we're going to be looking in a minute at the way that the phrasing of those two sections mirror one another. So section 149, we all know this, of course, um, but one of the things that it requires is it requires a public authority to have due regard to the need to advance equality of opportunity. So this is, of course, the headline of part 11. So this is what part 11 is, is dealing with. It's dealing with the advancement of equality. Can we have the next slide, please? And having due regard to the need to advance equality of opportunity uh, between persons who share a, a relevant protected characteristic and those who do not, uh, involves in particular having due regard to the need to remove or minimize disadvantages that are connected to a characteristic, taking steps to meet the needs of persons who share a relevant protected characteristic that are different and encouraging persons who share a relevant protected characteristic to participate in public life or in any other activity in which participation is disproportionately low. So I just wanted to draw out how these, uh, the, these, these different provisions um, relate to one another. If we can have the next slide, um, thank you. Um, so section 1496 uh, uh, states that compliance with the duties in this section, so this is the PSED, may involve treating some persons more favorably than others. So the PSED may involve treating some persons more favorably, but that is not to be taken as permitting conduct that was would otherwise be prohibited by or under this act. So what that then suggests, um, if we go to the next slide, is that whilst the PSED may just may mean treating people more favorably, it can't in itself justify positive discrimination, which as I said earlier, is unlawful. If you want to justify positive action, you have to go to section uh, 158. So, um, and that is described if we look at the, the Israel Burial Society case as being a more limited power. So to, to follow it through, there may be a duty under section 149 to treat people more favorably, but you can only do that through section 158, which is a more limited power. If we can have the next slide, please. 
Um, now, th this is me slightly laboring the point, and I, I'm, I'm worried that potentially this is a, this is a little bit patronizing, but it's but it's important, I think, to, to trace this through. So what we have in section 149 and then reflected in section 158 are these three different uh, characteristics or circumstances in which then there might be scope for positive action. So first is removing or minimizing the disadvantage connected to a characteristic. So we can see that at section 1493A, there is a, a duty to have due regard to the need to remove or minimize those disadvantages that are connected to their characteristic. Then at 1581A, if P reasonably thinks that a person who shares a protected characteristic suffers a disadvantage connected to that characteristic, then there is the power under 1582A to take steps uh, for the purpose of enabling or encouraging persons who share the protected characteristic to overcome or minimize that disadvantage. If we go to the next slide, please, we can see the same thing, meeting needs that are different from persons who don't have that protected characteristic. And again, section 149 is the duty to have due regard to the need to take steps to meet the needs of uh, persons who share a relevant protected characteristic that are different. Then there is the power to, then there is the circumstances in which positive action may be taken at 1581B. Then we have the power to take that positive action and what that positive, positive action is at 1582B. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and finally, um, encouraging participation in public life. And we see the same thing, same three characteristics flowing from section 149 into section 158. And so you can see why it is that these are two provisions which actually go hand in hand and should really be looked at as part of the same part, part, part of, of part 11, and part of the same general obligation of the advancement of equality. Now, I have to say that, that there, there's no case which spells out in detail that this is the way that, that um, these sections should be approached. But it, it, in my view, it's abundantly clear when you look at the way those sections are drafted that they're intended to go together. So can we move to the next slide, please? So is there a duty to take positive action? Can, can it ever be said that there is a duty? Well, we've already seen that section 1496 recognises that compliance with the duties in that section may involve treating some persons more favourably than others, provided those actions are not prohibited. But whether or not, in fact, section 149 does involve treating some persons more favourably is obviously going to depend on the circumstances of the case. The, the what disadvantage it is that has been identified, what sort of decision it is that is being taken. And it's fair to say that the law on the public sector equality duty is not going in a terribly favorable direction uh, when it comes to any suggestion that I would want to put before the court that it would involve taking the positive action on its own. So I think section 149 is probably a bit of a non-starter. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? Um, where there might be a duty to take positive action is when we start looking at indirect discrimination under section 19. And you'll recall that indirect discrimination is essentially a situation where a provision criteria or practice of general application has a disproportionate adverse impact on persons sharing a particular uh, protected uh, characteristic. And in those circumstances, that PCP becomes unlawful. And one might infer from that, that there is then a duty to do something about that illegality, to do something about that discrimination. Uh, but it's certainly not on its own any sort of obligation to take any particular positive step. What is perhaps um, more uh, useful, or more relevant is this concept of thriminos discrimination. Uh, and we see this in relation to Article 14. So uh, you'll remember that in, in that case, uh, the court held that the, right, the Article 14 right not to be discriminated against in the enjoyment of rights guaranteed under the Convention 
is also violated when states without an objective and reasonable justification fail to treat differently persons whose situations are significantly different. And it's important here because it is a failure to act that makes thriminous discrimination unlawful. And again, one might inf <coughs> infer from that, and it's not much of a stretch at all, that that is therefore a duty to do something, to, to take some positive step. And of course, the thriminous case has been applied in numerous cases under domestic law. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, this is a good example of a case which has really got the closest that I have seen, uh, certainly in domestic law, to any sort of obligation to take positive action. Now, <clears throat> this case concerned a challenge to a coroner's, I realise I've written corona there, but I think, I think you can all understand that I'm, I'm meant to say cor uh, coroner. So this uh, concerned a challenge to a coroner's policy that no death would be prioritised in any way over any other because of the religion of the deceased uh, or the deceased's family. Now, uh, Jewish and Muslim people had, were at a particular disadvantage in relation to this. Uh, policy because uh, certainly in the case of, of Jewish people there was a religious need to be uh, buried as soon as possible and ideally on the date of, of death. So the, the fact that all deaths were being treated in the same way put Jewish people at a particular disadvantage in relation to that policy and the court held that it was unlawful uh, it amounted to a fetter on the dis on uh, discretion. It was a breach of Article 9, so that's the right to uh, manifest religion. Uh, it was a breach of Article 14 in conjunction with uh, Article 9. And it was a breach of the, uh, of, of the, the thliminous principle. So it was a, a failure to treat differently situations that were significantly different. It was also, <coughs> also a breach of Section 19 of the Equality Act. We have the next slide, please. Now, this is um, a, an extract from the, 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 uh, the headnote uh, re recording the uh, submissions that were made, but these were accepted um, by the judge. So uh, the senior coroner's contention that it would be uh, positively unlawful for her to prioritise the release of Jewish and Muslim bodies over those of the general population since it would involve unlawfully discriminating against others contrary to the Equality Act is wrong. The criteria in section 158 of the 2010 Act are met in the present context. Jews and Muslims have a need for early burial, which will often be different from those who do not share their protected characteristic, i.e. based on religion. And there are clearly proportionate steps which could be taken to meet those needs. Uh, by having a flexible non-blanket policy which takes religious beliefs into account. There was no legal obligation on the senior coroner to have adopted the policy, quite the contrary. And this quite the contrary is the interesting bit and that's reflected at paragraph uh, 109 of the, of the decision, which it, whilst it doesn't expressly say that there is any obligation to take positive action, it gets very close to it gets very close to saying that, uh, saying that uh, prioritization of the same uh, death of some deaths for religious uh, reasons would not be unlawful. To the contrary, it would be consistent with section one five eight. So remember that the court found that there was a breach of the thlemonous principle, and finding that there was that breach also found that it would have been lawful to have taken steps under section uh, 158. So um, that's as close as we're going to get really to there being any sort of obligation to take positive uh, action. And so the simple point is really that whilst there is no obligation to take positive action under section uh, 158, there might be, in effect, an obligation to take positive action by virtue of some other provisions, perhaps Article 14, perhaps Section 19, uh, perhaps, though it's difficult to see the law going in this way, perhaps pursuant to Section 149. We have the next slide, please. Um, 
so uh, this is, of course, the, the, the big recent case, the uh, Agudas Israel Housing Association case, uh, which was um, <clears throat> a judgment was handed down, I think, uh, 10 days ago or so uh, by the Supreme Court. Now, in this case, the claimants challenged uh, nomination arrangements uh, between Hackney and uh, the Agudas Israel Housing Association, which amounted to uh, about 1% of the uh, of Hackney's housing stock. The Housing Association's charitable objective was to make housing, uh, social housing available primarily, and this was important, for members of the Orthodox Jewish uh, community. But the fact was that in practice, because housing stock was very limited, all of its properties uh, were allocated to members of the Orthodox uh, Jewish community. Uh, Hackney didn't have uh, any right to compel uh, the Housing Association to take tenants who didn't fall within uh, the scope of its charitable objectives. So in practice, Hackney uh, only nominated uh, people who were members of the Orthodox Jewish uh, community. And in fact, in practice, what happened was that properties were advertised on the bidding system as being properties for Orthodox Jews. And that, that's how they were advertised. Have the next slide, please. Um, so the claimants uh, were a mother and son, uh, and they had the highest uh, priority under the allocation scheme. And because this was the way that properties were advertised, they could see that in an 18 month period, six four bedroom properties, which would have been suitable for them, uh, came and went that they couldn't bid on. And it might have been that they would have been um, allocated uh, those properties, but for the fact that they were not members of the Orthodox uh, Jewish community. So they argued that um, the, uh, the, the nomination arrangements were unlawful because they breached section 13. Can we have the next slide, please. So it was common ground that the policy uh, was discriminatory. It did amount to direct discrimination. Um, but the Housing Association argued that it was lawful pursuant to Section 158 or Section 193, which we'll come to in, in a moment, but I think I'm going to run out of time to, to deal with that. But that's in relation to the operation of, of charities. Um, the Court of Appeal had held that such discrimination uh, was lawful pursuant to Section 158 or 193, uh, and the claimants appealed on the basis that the approach to proportionality was wrong. So remember that positive action has to be proportionate to the legitimate aim. Um, can we have the next uh, slide, please? So section 193, uh, I, I think I'm probably not gonna have time to deal with this, but this is essentially the uh, provision which enables charities to provide services only to uh, members of um, particular who share a protected particular protected characteristic and they can do those either under section 1932a whereby it needs to be a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim or under section 1932b where it's for the purpose of preventing or compensating for a disadvantage linked to the protected characteristic can we have the next slide please um, so the divisional court's finding was that uh, the that the, the uh, Orthodox Jewish community did suffer disadvantages uh, and problems which were connected uh, to their religion. And, and frankly, it makes for pretty grim reading. Um, there is a, a long list of all of the difficulties uh, that are encountered by members of the Orthodox Jewish community, uh, including being uh, more likely to need social housing, more likely to be in grossly overcrowded accommodation, more likely to suffer uh, from anti-Semitism. Um, and in relation to the needs that members of such a uh, community had, uh, well, of course, it included all sorts of religious specific needs, including the need to be near a synagogue, the need, need to have kosher kitchens, the need to be near bathhouses and so on. So there, there are lots of particular needs that uh, related to uh, members of the Orthodox uh, Jewish community. And those weren't disputed. So the, the divisional court's finding was that the disadvantages faced by Orthodox Jews were real and substantial. They were connected with the religion of Orthodox Judaism. The needs of the members of the Orthodox Jew Jewish community were different from those who were not members of it. 
and the arrangements that the Housing Association had put in place um, for allocating uh, housing uh, enabled them to avoid those disadvantages and meet those needs. So you would think that it was all there, really. Um, but as I say, the issue was one of proportionality. If we can have the next slide, please. So the claimants argued that the assessment of proportionality under section uh, 158 could only effectively be used as a tiebreaker. So it could only be used to promote equality of opportunity and not equality of outcome, so substantive equality. Uh, but the Supreme Court, frankly, didn't think very much of this. The cases that were relied upon by the claimants, uh, it was said, tell one nothing of significance about the proper approach to proportionality. And the reason for that was because the, a lot of the cases that were relied upon came out of um, sex discrimination and sex equality. And uh, the, the directives which deal with sex equality expressly set, limited the power to take positive action to equality of opportunity and not equality of outcome. If we can go to the next slide, please. So the Supreme Court thought that what was more relevant was the decision in, uh, of Cresco, because Cresco also concerned religious discrimination. That this was a case where um, Austria had a, a policy where members of certain Christian sects um, were entitled to have Good Friday off work. And if they did work, then they were entitled to a bonus. Um, now, on the facts of that case, uh, that was not permissible. And the reason why it was not permissible was because, first of all, it didn't address any particular disadvantage, but also, even if it did, the, um, it, it wasn't proportionate. The reason why it wasn't proportionate was in part because um, members of other religions didn't or didn't also get uh, religious holidays off. So it, it's not as though uh, Jews got Yom Kippur off or Muslims got Eid off. It was a specific, more favorable treatment to certain members of certain um, Christian groups. Uh, and the, the, the Supreme Court that this thought that this was much more relevant because the framework directive, which dealt with religious discrimination did provide for a quality of outcome. So Article 7 of the Framework Directive said, with a view to ensuring full equality in practice, the principle of equal treatment shall not prevent any member state from maintaining or adopting specific measures to prevent or compensate for disadvantages linked to any of the grounds uh, referred to in Article 1. Can we have the next uh, slide, please? Um, so and so for that reason, and I'm going to hurry through, I think, some, some of this, um, it, essentially this meant that we were looking at, in re relation to religion, substantive equality as opposed to equality of opportunity. And that meant the scope of what could be done potentially under positive action was significantly wider and it was open to uh, someone that might otherwise be discriminating to take wider uh, or more significant steps and for those steps still to be proportionate. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, further, Cresco uh, confirmed that it was the conventional approach to proportionality, so not this tiebreaker concept, which the claimants had argued for, but it was just the normal proportionality that we are um, all used to dealing with. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, now, the second issue that came up in relation to proportionality was, well, are we looking at, at proportionality from in terms of weighing up the effect on individuals or are we looking at weighing up the relative advantage or disadvantage to groups of people? So the local authority said that the disadvantage to non-Jews or rather non-Orthodox Jews was minuscule. And the reason why they said it was minuscule was because after all, the Housing Association only had 1% of the total house, housing stock. Now, in fairness, the Agudas Israel Housing Association specializes in larger properties. And so while it might only be 1% of the um, total housing stock, it was a more significant percentage of the housing stock of larger properties. And we could see this being played out in what had happened uh, with the claimants, that in the 18 month period, they had missed out on six four bedroom properties. So the impact on her was not minuscule. 
But the Supreme Court said that, well, really, it's not about the individuals at all. So in assessing the proportionality of the policy in the light of that aim, the courts below were entitled to weigh the benefits for that community as a group as compared with the disadvantages evidenced by other groups as a result, rather than by comparing the benefits for that community uh, with the disadvantage suffered by one person drawn from those other groups falling outside the policy. We have the next slide. Um, and <clears throat> we can see this at paragraph uh, 80 and 82, and 82 in particular, the proportionality assessment would be distorted by simply taking the worst affected individual who is, not <clears throat> who is not covered by the measure and comparing her with the most favourably affected individual who is covered by it. So we're looking always when it comes to positive action at group disadvantage or group advantage. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, so this is uh, section 193B. I, I'm not going to, to dwell on this really because this is a rather technical point in relation to charities. Um, so if we can uh, move on uh, two slides, I think, to where it says uh, where next. So um, in terms of where this takes us for housing, uh, the, here are the sort of the key points. Positive action is only going to apply to group or systemic disadvantage, uh, lack of representation or to the needs that are connected to a particular characteristic as a group. Now, when we're looking at disabled people, of course, we're not looking at all disabled people. We're looking at a particular disabil uh, disability. Likewise, when we're looking at religions, we don't necessarily need to look at all Jewish people. It's legitimate to look at, for example, Haredi or, um, or, or Orthodox uh, Jewish people. Uh, but nonetheless, it must be this group disadvantage. It is possible that there may be a duty to take steps where there would otherwise be some form of discrimination. So I said this earlier, there's no duty to take positive action. It's simply a power, an option uh, that, a, that, that, that a person has. But where there would otherwise be some form of discrimination, then it might be argued uh, that the only way of avoiding that discrimination is to take positive action. The situations in which this might arise in the context of housing might, for example, be challenges to procurement strategies. Is the local authority obtaining enough of the right sort of accommodation? One of the issues in the Agudas Israel case was that the, that was that the types of properties which were being offered were specific to meet the needs of people from the Orthodox Jewish community. They were larger properties for bigger families. They had manual locks on the door so that they could be used um, on the Sabbath. It, they had, uh, for example, kosher kitchens. So there were all sorts of adaptions that were made to these properties to make them suitable. Well, if, if there is an issue about the sort of properties that are in a, a council's housing stock, it might be that there is an issue about uh, procurement or there might be an issue about allocations. There might also be issues in relation to funding or management decisions. So for example, a decision to cut floating support that is provided to tenants. And similarly, there might also be challenges uh, to homelessness policy decisions. So the way that applications are in general dealt with, a requirement, for example, that um, interim accommodation in a hostel is accepted, or a requirement that you attend the uh, council offices in person on the day, as we very often come across. So there are these potential challenges, but, uh, but there, they are within relatively strict limits. And what we've got to keep coming back to are these three characteristics that we looked at when we were looking at section 149 and section 158. So disadvantages that are connected to the protected characteristic, for example, or disproportionate participation and things of that nature. Uh, so I'm gonna hand over there to Ben, having talked, I'm sure, for far more than my share. I'm gonna to remember to unmute myself, which I've just finally done. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm gonna be talking possibly about more familiar ground, um, discrimination and homelessness. 
But um, the title of this series is Where Next? And I think it's fitting that we should really focus on the questions, the unknowns. So I'm not going to be giving you a lot of answers. I'm hopefully going to be raising some things that we should all think about in, in terms of where to go uh, and bring the kinds of cases that we maybe haven't brought in the past. So uh, broadly speaking, what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to look a, a quick reminder about the basic rules on uh, these three types of discrimination and then look at some possible cases of how and when to raise these issues. When we're looking in particular at the handling of homelessness applications on the part seven. So what do we know? And this is fairly confident ground. We know that part six of the Housing Act allocation is a service to the public. A couple of cases there that, that, that confirm that, including Agudas. And likewise, very likely, and I'm almost certain that part seven will be treated as a service to the public. Um, if not, it will be a public function. So we know then that part three of the Equality Act will apply. Um, and importantly, under section 29, that will impose a prohibition on discriminating in these ways. And that's by not providing the service, or um, discriminating as to the terms on which the service is provided, or by terminating the provision, for example, uh, withdrawing homelessness accommodation, or by subjecting someone to any other treatment. So pretty wide ranging, and just the proviso at the last bullet point there, that um, this applies to all the protected characteristics, but not to age insofar as it relates to persons under 18, and not to marriage. This is just a reminder um, that Section 19, um, indirect discrimination, and as Sarah's already uh, explained, the root of it is identifying some provision, criterion, or practice which puts people who share a relevant protected characteristics, such as disability, sex, race, at a particular disadvantage. And of course, it can be justified. So, so that's one of the areas that is often uh, in dispute. And again, a reminder of the duty or the rule uh, about making reasonable adjustments. And importantly, this is modified uh, by Schedule 2, where uh, it, it applies in the sphere of, of a public service or a public function. And the modifications are, are in the square brackets. So the first requirement, for example, applies wherever there's a PCP, which puts disabled persons generally at a substantial disadvantage. And what's important about that is it, it imposes a, an anticipatory duty. So in other words, it's not like managing premises. Uh, you, if you're a homeless applicant, you don't have to request a reasonable adjustment. Um, if it's something that, that um, puts, for example, um, disabled person generally at a substantial disadvantage, then um, uh, uh, the local authority may have been required to make an adjustment um, even before you, you, you get there and, and you've raised the issue with them. Second requirement, um, physical feature, I'm not gonna say much about, um, but the third requirement, uh, about the provision of an auxiliary aid. Uh, uh, that, that's worth bearing in mind um, because auxiliary aid is a pretty open-ended term. And um, for example, if you look at the, uh, the, the code, the guidance that's produced on services and public functions, it gives an example of an auxiliary aid as staff assistance to disabled people. And I'm gonna say a bit more about how that might, uh, might arise later on. So that's a reminder of those two uh, types of discrimination. In terms of indirect discrimination and the first requirement for reasonable adjustments, they both, as I said, hinge on identifying a provision criterion or practice, a PCP. And, um, uh, the thing to note about that um, is that 
uh, it, it's not enough to say um, that you have been disadvantaged in some way, for example, by a one-off failure. So, you know, if you're a disabled homeless applicant, for example, um, and there's a particular act of maladministration which causes you a problem, that will not necessarily amount to a PCP. This case is from this year, a Court of Appeal, and it makes it clear that what's involved in PCP is some kind of state of affairs or a, a way in which things are done generally, uh, which either will or may affect other people. And so the way you've been treated might be a one-off, but it will only be a PCP if it demonstrates the way that, for example, the local authority are likely to act um, towards other people. What's the difference? Very briefly, this is just a quick note on, on what's the difference between indirect discrimination and, and the first requirement to make reasonable adjustments. Well, one of the differences is justification. Um, the, 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 you can justify indirect discrimination under section 19. Uh, you can't justify a failure to make a reasonable adjustment, but of course, uh, there'll be a judgment involved in what's reasonable and what's not. Um, in standing wise, you can uh, bring a claim for indir indirect discrimination if there's a PCP which puts you at a disadvantage or would put you at a disadvantage. So you don't need to show that it has already been applied to you necessarily. Um, uh, arguably, that, it, that doesn't apply, I think, with a reasonable adjustment, because if you're going to make out a claim for discrimination on that basis, you've got to show that there was a failure to comply with the duty to make a reasonable adjustment in relation to you. And then lastly, uh, remedy, just a quick warning that, that for indirect discrimination, unintentional uh, breaches uh, uh, won't necessarily result in the award of damages. You've got, the court's got to look at the other, uh, other forms of relief you can grant first. And um, it, also a, a, a quick word of warning about limitations. And um, if you are thinking of bringing a claim for discrimination, you need to have an eye to two schedules in particular. The first is Schedule 22, um, which deals with statutory authority. And it's pretty complicated and you're gonna to need to check it fairly carefully because it sets out a detailed table um, that, that deals with possible defenses that might be available, depending on which provision you're relying on, which protected characteristic, and, um, uh, 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 and what's the source of the authority that, that the um, service provider or the public function, provider of the public function are, are um, working under. So for example, um, there will be no contravention of part three, which is what we're looking at, in respect of disability, if uh, a, a, a local authority, for example, does anything which it must do pursuant to either an enactment or a requirement or condition imposed by virtue of an enactment. So in other words, either primary legislation or secondary legislation. Likewise, you've got to check schedule 23, which contains um, some further exceptions and um, defenses. And I mean, I just flag up, two paragraphs. Paragraph one has got some specific rules about uh, potential discrimination based on nationality or residence. And paragraph three deals with communal accommodation. And then lastly, um, the, this is a case, and I could, we couldn't really get through this seminar, I think, without talking about a case of Stephen Nafflers, um, who, uh, uh, and, and this was, um, well, I, th I thought a brilliant argument from, from him, seeking to persuade the court that local authorities had a duty under section 21 of the Housing Act 1985 to accommodate people 
um, including persons from abroad. Um, the reason I raise it, ultimately it didn't succeed, and the reason I raise it is because the court ruled that um, the 90, part seven, the 96 act is the only way or the only source of uh, a, a local authority's power to accommodate homeless people. So all cases where the authority have reason to believe that a person is homeless are to be funneled through part seven of the act. Uh, and what I think that means, I mean, it's really interesting as to what it means. I mean, what does it mean, for example, for the everyone in policy that's currently operating during coronavirus? Um, uh, uh, for our purposes, I think what it means is you've got to keep an eye on what you're really asking the authority to do. If you're asking them to do something that they are not authorized to do, or to provide accommodation, for example, that they're not authorized to do under part seven, then arguably uh, they simply don't have the power to, to do it. So I flag that up as a potential limitation for any uh, discrimination case. And um, I'm not gonna dwell on this, but this is a special limitation uh, that applies to the reasonable adjustments duty. Uh, uh, and you'll see um, if you're asking the authority to do something which is fundamentally different from what they usually do under part seven, then that, that might not be viable either. So what do we do with all of that? Um, while we're waiting for that tsunami of possession cases to be reactivated, uh, what I suggest one thing we can do is uh, try to think in novel ways about how we might use discrimination claims in a homelessness context. And these are a few ideas. Uh, some of them may well turn out to be half-baked. Some of them may turn out to be to have substance, but they're kinds of things that I think we ought to explore. First up, accommodation, interim accommodation. How many times do we come across a case where somebody who's got a particular housing need um, says, look, goes to, the, goes to the HPU, they say, look, I'm about to be evicted in a week's time. Um, please plan ahead. Make sure you've got some suitable interim accommodation that you can give me either now or, or before the eviction date. And the authorities say, nope, sorry. Uh, our practice is you have to pitch up on the day that the warrant is executed, it's only then that we will give you interim accommodation. That practice, think about wheelchair users, for example. Uh, it, 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 on the face of it, does put uh, people with particular needs at a disadvantage. That example might be disability. Uh, people with a very large family might put minority groups at a disadvantage as well. Uh, so that's the sort of situation where you might have an argument that there's been either indirect discrimination uh, and or a failure to make reasonable adjustments if the issue is, is disability. Second, second bullet point, um, personal housing plans and uh, uh, the, the, the steps that include it, uh, are included in the plan that the authority think are reasonable steps it might take to help someone. Uh, do they have a practice of the way they approach that, which uh, arguably uh, puts disabled people or people who share some protected characteristic at a particular disadvantage? Or, uh, for example, um, if they are uh, intentionally homeless, what does the plan say about the accommodation that will be provided under section 190 uh, in terms of, uh, of giving them a reasonable opportunity to find accommodation? If they have a practice or a policy of saying we'll impose a 28 day uh, period of standard, uh, that might also give rise to uh, potential arguments about discrimination. The third example, um, is about uh, offers of accommodation under part seven. Now, uh, I've put a reference there to the Adesoto case, which I'm gonna talk about a bit more about later. But what happened in that case is uh, somebody um, with some mental health issues, 
was uh, given an offer of temporary accommodation and told to make a decision about it uh, pretty quickly. And uh, in the event, didn't feel able to take it and refused it. And that led to a cessation of duty decision. Uh, think also about the uh, uh, old case of Caton and Newham, where it was held that a local authority uh, could uh, require applicants to accept or reject an offer of B&B accommodation without seeing it first. If you've got somebody with mental health issues, uh, it may well be arguable that those sorts of practices put them at a particular disadvantage. Uh, and unless the authority can come up with a case on justification, then again, there might be scope for saying that's discrimination. The fourth one um, is a bit of an unusual case, but it's one that I've come across where a, a, a local authority have said to all their homeless applicants, um, look, if you take, if you can find a private tenancy during the prevention stage or the relief stage, uh, and before we have to accept any section 193 duty, then uh, we'll give you extra priority under part six. Now that's really uh, a, 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 an issue about part six, I think as much as, as part seven. But again, um, it, it, it seems to me that that sort of policy uh, might well put um, single parents at a particular disadvantage because they're less likely to be able to uh, uh, secure a private tenancy and maintain the rent, um, more likely to be subject to the benefit cap, for example. Um, or again, if you've got disabled people with, with particular housing needs, again, they might be less able to take advantage of that policy. Uh, uh, and it may well be that they are then disadvantaged because other people are unable to jump the queue ahead of them. So again, there might be a basis for saying discrimination. Uh, affordability, similar sort of argument. Um, does the authority have a, a policy or a practice about charging uh, that, that puts people at disadvantage? And then the next point, um, procure temporary accommodation uh, and two issues really. I mean, one is procurement policy. And this is Sarah, this is a point that, 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 that um, Sarah touched on. Um, it, it, Authorities are supposed now or recommended to have in place uh, policies that, that deal with the procurement of temporary accommodation. Many of them do, many of them publish them. Uh, can we uh, scrutinize them and see whether they uh, failure, fail to or take appropriate account of, of the needs of particular groups? Or um, go back again to, to, to older case law, um, the, there's an old uh, one of the cases of I think Begum and Newham, in which um, Mr. Justice Collins found there'd been a breach of Section 193 because a local authority had failed to secure suitable accommodation for a large family. Um, and they'd had a policy of never using their own stock to provide temporary accommodation. I mean, that was found to be a uh, put them in breach of section 193, uh, but it might also be framed as a claim for discrimination if it impacts on a particular group. And then um, just another idea, which uh, uh, is just thrown out there about accommodation pending review, section 1883 accommodation. Does the authority have a particular practice or policy of, of providing it in only very, very limited circumstances and is it arguable that that impacts disproportionately on a particular group all these things i think are worth exploring and it's worth keeping an eye out to see if there are any other practices which are, are likely to 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 um, bring into play section 19 or, or reasonable adjustments and then very briefly, this is a reminder about one the, the other relevant 
type of discrimination. I think we're, Section 15, we're, we're familiar with it from possession defences, for example. Uh, obviously, particularly focused on disability and relying uh, not on a, a, a difference in treatment, but uh, on causation, on there being a causal link. Where might it be useful? Well, um, remember Astor and Ackerman Livingston, we, we're all familiar, I think, probably with this case in terms of defending a claim for possession. It's worth remembering that the accommodation in, in that case was, was provided under part seven. And um, the, the, the causal, the cause for the eviction, the proposed eviction, was that the applicant had refused an offer of suitable accommodation, which had led to the discharge of duty and had led to the claim for possession. And the court found that there was that causal link and therefore section 15 was brought into play. Well, you know, there are lots of potentially homelessness cases, potential homelessness cases where you might say that the uh, uh, end of the duty was uh, resulted from something uh, arising in consequence of, of disability. And indeed, Adesotu, was was that case or a very similar case too so you you got somebody with mental health issues uh, they are required to accept temporary accommodation uh, they panic they refuse it arguably because of because of in consequence of disability uh, and uh, that might also bring section 15 into play but there are other, other instances um, loss of temporary accommodation, for example, because of rent arrears that have accrued uh, as a result of, of disability. Or the refusal, suppose somebody misses a review deadline and the authority refused to carry out an out of time review request. Could that give rise to a section 15 claim? It, it might do. Um, and, and failure to accommodate, you know, suppose somebody, suppose for example, a, uh, a wheelchair user uh, it pitches up, applies as homeless, and the authority um, put them in grossly unsuitable accommodation because they simply can't find something that is suitable. Um, it, 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 it might be worth exploring a Section 15 claim on the grounds that um, they have been put in unsuitable accommodation in consequence of disability, because uh, if they didn't have a disability, the chances are they'd have been suitably housed. So again, it, it, it might be worth explain, exploring section 15. So how are you gonna raise all these uh, potential claims? Well, um, it, the first, there are three broadly, I think three answers. And one of them is a freestanding claim or discrimination brought in the county court. And the county court has jurisdiction to deal with claims based on all three of those, all those three types of discrimination. It doesn't have jurisdiction to deal with breach of section 149, the public sector equality duty, and that's something I'll, I'll come back to. But for those three claims, for those three types of discrimination, it can grant any remedy that could be granted by the High Court, including on the, on the JR. And so uh, one of them is damages, uh, and they might be consequential loss, you know, special damages, uh, accommodation costs, whatever, lost belongings. Uh, they might be general damages for injury to feelings, which are specifically provided for under the Act. And as I suspect many of you will know, that there is a broad brush approach to those damages, according to three bands set out in Vendor, set out originally in Vento and Chief, Chief Constable, um, up, uprated and the third addendum to the presidential guidance of the employment tribunal uh, gives the, the current bands. Uh, Probably if there is discrimination in a homelessness case, it's going to be more than a one-off 
event, it might be a continuing uh, failure, in which case it seems to me we ought to be pitching for awards in the middle Vento band. And it can also grant crushing orders and it can also grant injunctive relief. Now this is a, 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 a Z has thrown out an idea which he might have more to say about later. Um, supposing you've got a homelessness case, for example, where somebody's put in unsuitable temporary accommodation or interim accommodation, and there's a potential disability claim along one of the, the uh, or angle to it, along one of the, the ways that we've talked about. You might go off to the administrative court, you might seek um, interim relief there, or you might issue your claim for discrimination and damages in the county court, and you might seek an interim injunction there. And uh, my first reaction when I heard this was to think, well, I'm not really sure I want this, the circuit judges in central London dealing with my um, interim relief applications. But of course, we're not, we're not talking about the circuit judges in central London, we're talking about the district judges, probably. Um, and um, you might end up with a very sympathetic district judge in central London who would grant you uh, interim relief on a homelessness case if you can uh, frame the claim in terms of discrimination, who knows? So a couple of points to note. Um, first off, the limitation period, six months from the act, uh, there's special provision for continuing acts, uh, in which case basically time starts to run from the last uh, 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 act in a, in a series or course of conduct. And then a word about legal aid. And uh, the rule is that basically discrimination claims fall into whichever category of law uh, covers the underlying substance of the case. So if it's really about homeless, homelessness provision, it ought to be covered by a housing contract. That deals with county courts. What about um, the second option, judicial review? Well, uh, the, the admin court keeps its jurisdiction to deal with discrimination issues. That's uh, in section 113 of the Act. The question that will arise is whether you should be issuing in the admin court or whether you have an adequate alternative remedy because you can go to the county court instead. And I think the answer to that is if you want to go to the admin court, then you need to probably include uh, some other public law issue, such as breach of section 149, in addition to a claim for discrimination. Because as I said, the county court doesn't have the jurisdiction to deal directly with a breach of section 149. But if your case really turns on and is going to require a decision or findings of fact, then uh, the admin court may not be appropriate. I'll put a reference there to the Lunt case, which, which is useful in giving some, some guidance as the sort of factual disputes that the admin court can deal with and can't deal with. And what about damages? Well, there's no reason why you can't include a damages claim in a judicial review claim. Uh, but uh, it, it seems to me it's likely that once the courts uh, dealt with liability, you're going to get transferred out for an assessment of damages to the county court afterwards. And if you are going to wrap up a discrimination claim with a usual or a sort of more ordinary public law breach of part seven claim, then you need to think carefully about costs. Uh, and certainly I've uh, had an issue on one case I dealt with where uh, we claimed breach of the section 193 duty for a failure to provide suitable accommodation, but also included a claim for discrimination uh, really arising from the same facts. And uh, after the local authority provided accommodation, uh, the admin court um, transferred it out to the county court, but didn't award 
the JR costs. And that will, if you get into that situation, it will impact on your client because of the statutory charge. Third option, not county court, not judicial review, but section 202, homelessness review. Now, uh, many of you will have heard of the Adesoto and Lewisham case, a fairly recent case from the Court of Appeal, where uh, the Court of Appeal confirmed that what you can't do is uh, issue a homelessness appeal and plead directly discrimination. So you can't include in your grounds of appeal um, this decision uh, it, uh, amounts to or gives rise to indirect discrimination because it was based on a practice which puts disabled people disadvantage and uh, at a disadvantage as, uh, as Ms. Ms. Adesotu tried to, to, to do. And the reason you can't do that is because um, the Act says you've got to bring it by way of a claim, i.e. Part 7 claim in the County Court, and um, a Section 204 appeal is neither a claim nor a judicial review. And anyway, a Section 204 appeal uh, has to be based on something arising from the review decision. And in Ms. Adesoto's case, um, she hadn't raised these issues, and this is crucial, she hadn't raised them before, it, well, in the review process, and therefore they weren't dealt with in the review decision. And I say that's crucial because what you can still do is raise issues about discrimination in the course of the review and then require the review officer to deal with them. And then if you disagree, you'll say there's a, a public law failing in the way that he deals with them. You can raise that then in your section 204 appeal um, uh, uh, in the usual way, po probably calling in or relying on section 149. Um, how would you raise it in a review? I mean, let's think about M Ms. Adesoto's case. So she uh, said that the process uh, which she'd been put through of being required to accept an offer at short notice was discriminatory. In other words, that the way the offer had been put was unlawful. Um, uh, how would you raise that? Well, I, I think it's really interesting and unclear as to how it will work. A couple of cases here that, that might be useful. Lewisham and Malcolm, this is, as you, you'll remember, this was the big case before the Quality Act came in. Uh, and it's got a really useful, uh, clear statement in it that uh, if a notice to quit uh, is discriminatory and is an unlawful act, the landlord should not be able to rely on it. And arguably, if an offer of accommodation is put in a way which is discriminatory, then, argue, uh, the, then the local authority ought not to be able to rely on it as a basis for saying end of duty. That might be one way of putting it. And I put another uh, uh, older case, pre-96 Act, Hazel time, which, which similarly says, well, it's, it refers to the need for an offer of accommodation under the 85 Act, the, the precursor to part seven, as having to be a proper offer if it's going to be made in discharge of a duty. So if you can somehow say the offer was unlawful, then you might be able to, to say uh, uh, that there's no cessation of duty. I think that's not straightforward and, and the reason I say that is because if you look at the way section 193 works, uh, the, the, for, in most cases, not, not 1935, but in 1936 um, and in 1937, um, the, the refusal of a part six offer, for example, or a PRSO offer, automatically brings the homelessness duty to an end. So uh, at least in terms of Malcolm, arguably 
uh, the, the authority isn't relying on uh, the, the, the offer. It, it's the operation of the law that says if this offer is made and it's refused, the, uh, the 193 duty will come to an end. And that's why I think you might need to dig deeper and argue as in hazel time that an offer that the duty only comes to an end if a lawful offer is um, is refused. I think that's the last slide. And um, so we're a bit overdue. Ten past four. Um, I hope that has, has has raised as many questions as it's answered because I really think um, this is an area where we can probably work together to look for really some new types of case to bring. Over to Zia. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ben and Sarah. So my takeaway from that is, is that the Equality Act, I think, is pregnant with opportunity. And I think uh, there are many more types of challenges uh, and cases in which the Equality Act can be used. But we had a question uh, in the question panel, uh, which uh, I'll have a little go at answering and then Perhaps Sarah and Ben can, can add something. Uh, Jonat says, is there any traction in a potential JR challenge over a local authority's failure to plan for provision of accommodation for people with certain protected characteristics? And uh, I think my view would be short answer is yes. So if you're thinking about disability, um, first of all, you would look at the homelessness strategy uh, secondly, you would look at the procurement policies that local authorities are, are required to have um, and see how they have thought about how they will seek to uh, address the needs of disabled people where those needs are different from uh, non-disabled people. And if they haven't done that, uh, then arguably, uh, well, one hesitates to use the word straightforward, but certainly I can see that there would be a, a challenge there. Um, I don't know if uh, Ben or Sarah, either of you have anything to add to that? Uh, I, only, only one thing, I, I think, from me, which is to say, I wouldn't necessarily assume, assume it should be a JR. I mean, if you've got a client who's been directly affected by it, then um, you, you might want to think about just going to the county court and asking for damages. Um, the, of course, the, the disadvantage with that is you couldn't plead directly breach of, of section 149, which, which mm. might be a large part of your case. But, but then again, I, I think if there was a breach of section 149, then that is gonna be relevant to the assessment of proportionality. So you can sort of rely on it obliquely in, in just the same way that you can rely on other public law obligations as a way of informing what is or is not a, a proportionate approach. Um, I was wondering, and this is this is perhaps a bit of a question uh, for you, Ben, um, but you were talking about uh, discharging uh, duty after an offer of, of accommodation. And, and I wondered about, uh, as an approach to sort of get round out of so to, uh, the possibility of, of, of simply bringing a claim for discrimination uh, mm -hmm. on the basis that duty has been discharged and seeking a quashing order from the county court um, in relation to the offer, uh, because of course you're, you're quite right, quashing the, the discharge of duty letter itself is perhaps uh, not helpful because all that does is tell you about your rights. Um, but I wondered whether that was a, was an approach. And what I was thinking was that if you were going to take that sort of approach, I think I would want to be issuing the claim in the county court within 21 days mm -hmm. so that you avoid any arguments about abuse of process and getting around time limits. And just interested to hear what your thoughts are on that, Ben. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it does raise one, one thing, um, which, which, I mean, if you're going to take the other route, if you're going to go down the, and you probably want to pursue both, if you're going to raise it on review as well, um, what, what it does highlight is that um, you've really got to be careful in your review reps, because you're going to have to deal really carefully with disability, for example. You know, it's not enough to say 
somebody's unwell, therefore they're disabled. You're going to have to spell out which of the daily activities uh, that they find more difficult as a result. You may need to evidence it. Uh, you're going to need to, if you're indirect discrimination, you need to spell out the policy. If you're going for disability related discrimination, you've got to spell out causation, whatever. You've got to really put your case clearly. Uh, and if you do that, then I think there'll be a real similarity between your review reps and what you might then claim in the county court. Um, but, but as to the effect of the county court quashing an offer that's been refused and has led to the end of duty, no idea. <laughs> I yeah. mean, it's all uncharted water, isn't it, really? Yeah. Um, but th there are lots of options out there, I think, that we haven't yet explored. Are there any more yeah. questions? I don't think there are. No. Well, OK, so we're, at, uh, we're coming up to quarter past four. Well, can I thank everyone uh, very much for attending? And uh, can I particularly thank Sarah and Ben for giving us such interesting and illuminating presentations, which have certainly left me with a, with a lot of food for thought. And uh, yes, and I hope uh, people who've attended today will attend. Again, I, we've got a, a, a question. We'll be able to get the slides. I think these, um, these seminar, seminars are recorded and then put on our website. And so you will be able to access them in that way. In fact, uh, I said that. So yes, uh, you will be able to see this seminar again. And the slides are as well and the slides, absolutely. All right, well, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm.